The following program is a co-production of Seattle Channel and Seattle City Club and sponsored by Comcast. Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib wears many hats, especially when the governor travels. Even if it's just to go to Voodoo Donuts for 10 minutes, um, <laughs> uh, I am the act, I serve as acting governor. They are the region's top cops, Seattle Police Chief Carmen Best. We're not going to arrest people because they're homeless, we, we will arrest people for criminal activity. And King County Sheriff Mitzi Johanknik. We can't police our way out of this. We are a cooperative partner in how we go about uh, bringing an end to homelessness. It's all coming up on Civic Cocktail. and welcome to April Civic Cocktail. I'm Joni Balter, and I'm so pleased to be here tonight with Washington Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib. We have two great journalists helping with the questions this evening, veteran TV journalist Enrique Cerna, and Amy Radel. She's a reporter for KUOW Radio. Hi, Lieutenant Governor, welcome. Thank you, Joni, great to be here with you. Thank you. So tell us candidly, right off the start, how often are you running the state while our current governor <laughs> campaigns for president? Are we uh, talking two days a week, three days a week? He's here Mondays? Uh, I don't know. Well, I, I serve as acting governor. So for those who don't know, because it's not, it's not the case in every state, but in our state, anytime the governor leaves the state, even if it's just to go to Voodoo Donuts for 10 minutes, um, <laughs> uh, I am the act, I serve as acting governor. Um, and, you know, governors uh, typically, if they serve in a leadership role for whatever reason nationally, um, that will pick up. This is the first time that a Washington state governor has run for president. Um, and so there is a lot of travel that comes with that. Um, he was, he was uh, gone Monday and Tuesday of this week. But he has worked really, really hard to be here um, on, on, for, for important, for bill signings, for example. Um, as we go through this legislative session. He's also very connected, uh, obviously, this being uh, 2019. Um, he is uh, connected to everything that's going on in the state, even when he's in Iowa or D.C. or New Hampshire. Well, do you think people, me, for example, make too much of Jay Inslee being out of town? You're, you're implying that he can manage the state by his cell phone and computer. I think, he's, I think it's, it's that um, state government is huge. And the governor serves uh, to set the agenda and ultimately on important questions, uh, the buck stops with him. But you know, 98% of what goes on uh, in the executive branch doesn't need to get to the governor. And so um, the chief of staff, his senior staff, uh, the entire governor, uh, governor's office, um, and all of his cabinet are very, very capably running the state um, when he's here, when he's not here, and uh, on, on critical issues, um, he's made aware of them. And then when there are um, situations that require um, the governor to act in an emergency capacity or something's proclamations, et cetera, that require the signature of the acting governor, then that's what I'm there for. But one thing that we've done... Well, do you uh, go sit at his desk and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's funny that you, why stop there? I actually think I should be able to show up to the residence. And uh, I, th I thought about doing that, you know, just on the first weekend he was gone, just showing up with like a duffel bag and just bluffing my way like the cadet that's guarding it there. I'll be like, what do you mean? This is what happens, you know what I mean? Um, um, no, but I'll tell you that, that one of the really nice things that has been a, a hallmark of our relationship, because we don't run as a ticket in Washington state. In many states, the governor and lieutenant governor run as a ticket, like the president and vice president. But what Governor Inslee and I agreed to when, uh, when I won the election was that we, just because we don't run as a ticket doesn't mean we can't govern as a ticket. And so even before he decided to run for president, um, we've been collaborating and working together in a way that's never been done before between these two offices, including combining um, our staffing around international relations. So, uh, so it's, it's a wonderful relationship. Our staffs work together on scheduling. One of the things, for example, is there'll be situations where um, the governor, even when he's in the state, can't make a certain event, uh, can't speak at a certain uh, ceremony. And so we, uh, call our staffs collaborate on scheduling so that I can fill in for him um, in that sense. I think it's been, it's been good for the state. 
What's the coolest governor thing you've done? Where you, you uh, couldn't reach him on the plane, the internet didn't work. Uh, giving the apple cup, presenting the apple cup oh. uh, was great. Um, and um, I, it's, it's just such cheap pandering here in Seattle. To say <laughs> I love giving it to the Huskies. Um, I, I did give him a hard time when he asked me um, whether I could fill in for him. And you know, it really looked like the Cougars might have a good shot at winning. And I just, I, I said, Governor, is this, is this just your way of not wanting to have to give the Apple Cup to the Cougars for the first time as governor? And he said, yeah, Trudy would never let me live that down. So, um, well, but, but the joke's on him, because I gave it to the Huskies. So well, uh, that's probably the, that was probably the most fun. Um, you have quite the compelling personal story, which I'll sum up with your, is it your personal slogan, campaign slogan, from Braille to Yale. You've had cancer three times and have been blind since age eight. How on earth did you overcome all of these challenges? Um, well, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a pithy summation. Uh, when you are a three-time cancer surviving, fully blind Iranian American from a mixed religion immigrant family, um, you face some obstacles. Uh, but, but I'll tell you, um, you know, I, I feel extraordinarily Privilege. We we use the, the I call it, you know we use the P word a lot these days on particularly on my side of the aisle and I think it can be dangerous sometimes because we will talk about you know rightly we will point out white privilege and male privilege and and straight white privilege but um, I think what sometimes gets obscured is the fact that um, you can uh, and and nearly all of us experience deficits of privilege in certain aspects of our lives like. I've been Iranian American my entire life, and that entire life has taken place um, since the Iran and, and the US have been mortal enemies. Um, I have been uh, blind for almost all of my life in a world that was built by and for people who are not blind. That said, um, I grew up uh, like less than a couple miles from Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos' homes um, in one of the wealthiest you know, I went through the Bellevue public school system. So uh, I was extremely privileged to be able to have a public school system that could, um, you know, we had to fight them on some things, but ultimately they had the money to be able to accommodate my disability. Um, I had a, uh, uh, both of my parents were fighters and advocates for me, but my mom um, was trained as a litigator, which helps. <laughs> uh, and, and she taught, she Did you actually sue, did she your family advocate. sue? We never know, we never sued, but, but it did get close. Um, when there were, there were times when the school didn't think that a blind kid should be able to play on the playground, on the jungle gym with other kids, or uh, be able to, or why should a blind kid be, have to, you know, uh, want to do Model UN after school, or take AP US history when they could just take the regular one. And teachers would say, or the administrators would say, you know, it's not required. My mom would say, well, if it's not required, then I guess no one in your school needs to do it. Um, that's the kind of, feist and fight that she uh, has and, and she taught me and um, ultimately that, that was the most important thing because I learned to advocate for myself and then in time I learned also to advocate for others since almost no one has the good fortune of having a 24 hour a day pro bono attorney as a mom. <laughs> so. Oh, that is an advantage. Uh, in, in addition to being lieutenant governor or on-call governor, you also describe yourself as the state's chief opportunity officer. What is that? So the way I describe my job is I wear three hats. One is, uh, we've already talked about, to be number two in the executive branch, partner with the governor, and serve as acting governor. Um, number, the se second hat is that I serve as president of our state senate irrespective of which party's in the majority. And so I have presided over a 25-24 Republican majority and a 25-24 Democratic majority. Um, I chair the committee that decides what bills get voted on by the Senate. I cast tie-breaking votes, which I have done. It does not happen often uh, since we have an odd number of senators in our state, but I like to say I don't vote often, but when I do, I win. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
and, and a number of other, and then, I, and then I make key parliamentary and procedural rulings in the Senate. And then the third hat I wear is that I run my own state agency. It's a small agency, um, creatively named the Office of the Lieutenant Governor. And in that agency, we focus on, um, th this is, these are things that are either given to us by statute um, or that we have decided as part of our mission to focus on. And we focus on two core areas, and those are um, expanding access to higher education and creating a college-going culture in our state and then expanding economic development through our state, particularly through international trade. And the reason that we focus on those two is that in my view, whether an individual, a community, or even an entire state is uh, going to be a winner or a loser in the 21st century really comes down to whether or not um, they benefit uh, from globalization, um, and whether or not they are able to prepare uh, their workforces or, or in, the, in the case of an individual themselves for the knowledge economy of the 21st century. So I just think those are the two most critical things that state government should be thinking about. Um, and for our state, the good news is that, you know, uh, where we are sitting here right now and the uh, surrounding uh, counties, uh, this central Puget Sound area has absolutely cracked the code on benefiting from global trade, on benefiting from foreign investment, benefiting from tourism, um, has absolutely cracked the code on higher education um, and having uh, such a low unemployment rate uh, because of how skilled our workforce is. The problem is that there are uh, another 35 counties that um, haven't had those benefits, and many of them are struggling, just like many parts of our country are struggling. And so chief opportunity officer for me means, first of all, it, it, I thought it was kind of clever because the governor is the CEO, and so if the lieutenant governor is the COO, I thought it was just, you know, I don't know, a little dad humor. <laughs> uh, but, I, but, I, but, but also it's all about expanding opportunities around the state and around the world uh, for Washingtonians. Okay, I'm gonna bring in Enrique Cerna. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, well, actually, listening to you, I'm just kind of wondering if, you're, if you ever thought about doing stand-up. Uh, you're pretty good. Um, one question I do have for you. In January, you elected to not preside over uh, the governor's state of the state address because you said that you felt vulnerable in the House chamber where people can carry concealed weapons in the public galleries. And uh, did you do that, I guess, to make a point? Or, was, or were you really concerned about your safety? Um, I, I, I think that uh, when you have a situation, for those who don't know, you know, the state of the state, like the state of the union, you know, you, you get, um, you know, you've got the governor, uh, all the nine statewide officials, all nine Supreme Court justices, the entire state legislature, um, many, you know, all the, the cabinet officials, all in one room. Um, and uh, in the Senate, where I preside, one of the first things I did was to outlaw guns in the Senate gallery. Um, you know, if you set foot, if you set, if you try to go into city or county buildings, courthouses, uh, obviously Congress, but even um, you know state capitals um, in such bleeding heart liberal places as Texas and Louisiana and South Carolina, you have to go through a metal detector to get into those buildings in Texas, okay? But not in Washington State. And so in the Senate, I made that change. I said, you know what? Um, if you're going to come into the Senate gallery, um, you shouldn't be able to bring a gun into that space. People should be able to feel safe. We have um, children. We have. But so you were making a point. High schoolers. No, no, but I want to give the context. We have high schoolers paging on the Senate floor. We have vulnerable adults um, who are visiting and school kids are visiting. So we did that in the Senate. Now, I don't have jurisdiction over the House of Representatives. So the Speaker of the House has decided that he, he thinks it should be open season on, on, um, on concealed guns, on concealed guns in the House. Uh, he thinks it's the people's house, and he has a principled position on that, um, that he thinks that's right. And so um, the, the, traditionally, the lieutenant governor has presided over, the, uh, state, over that joint session. Um, and in my view, when we could not get agreement, I said, well, if the House is going to have its, the House rules, then the uh, House should preside, not, not the Senate president. Um, so that's what it was about. It was, it was in that sense, it was principled. But I also do think that the person standing up there presiding 
including the governor um, and others, are vulnerable. And I didn't talk about it in the lead up to it because I didn't want to, you know, call down the furies, right? And and kind of signal to people how uh, you know how vulnerable the situation is. Uh, but I'll tell you, it is not. Uh, I, I don't consider it safe for the governor. I don't consider it safe for any of the people sitting in that. Um, in that chamber when we let people bring guns in without knowing who those people are. Very quickly, will you do it again next year? Uh, we will either, uh, I, I will, I'll, I have the same, I will care about my hide just as much in a year <laughs> as I do this year, and I, and I will care about the governors as well. And I, so we will either, um, uh, either host it in the Senate, um, as we do other joint sessions, or we will uh, require that uh, we have joint rules that model what the Senate does, or if we can't do those two, which I think we'll be able to do one of those, then the Speaker will preside. Amy Riedel. Um, I'd like to get your perspective on legislators attempting to deal with the measles outbreak in Washington State. Um, what do you think of removing the personal exemption uh, for vaccinations, and how are these changes going to be enforced if they're made? Uh, it's long overdue. I'll tell you, I. I, I you guys heard my story. I had chemo as a kid, right? So just think about that. Um, kids with suppressed immune systems um, that have to go to school. And, um, you know, this, to my mind, um, we want to make, we ought to make decisions based on the best interests of children. Um, and we ought to make decisions based on real science. Uh, and so this is a bipartisan proposal out of Clark County from Clark County legislators in a bipartisan way. Um, and uh, I couldn't be happier that we're doing this. And it's, in my view, it's long overdue. And, and the, you can just look down at the cases that are down there to see that this is a problem. So Lieutenant Governor can be a pretty obscure office. It has been for a lot of different years. But you've somehow made it more relevant. A little bit of luck with the governor traveling so much. Uh, do you want to be governor someday? Um, I'm not running for it this time, so I can. Uh, well, that I was can, I can tell you phrasing. that. I'm not running I can for tell it you that. Well, time. I don't. I'm look. I'm 37 years old. <laughs> I'm not gonna like make a commitment. Do I want to run for governor? I might. Um, I'm not doing it this time. Uh, even though I think like 2020 vision for a blind candidate, it's like kind of appealing. <laughs> I can use that for my reelection too, but um, but um, no, like I, it's it's um, you know it's it's uh, a tremendous uh, honor to have the job that I have. I've tried really hard to make it less obscure. Um, others have done that. I've learned from people like Gavin Newsom in California who did that um, in his role. Um, and you know, part of our job as lieutenant governor is to have in our minds a list of all the successful people who have once been lieutenant governor. So people like Tim Kaine, Howard Dean, um, and um, John Kerry. Um, and so, look, they they all did wonderful things with it. They went on and did other things in the future. Um, and so, uh, who knows? But that's one of the fun things about being 37. <laughs> okay. At, at age 37, are you planning to support Jay Inslee for president? Because when you and I spoke, you said that um, you're also pretty friendly uh, with South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Good job on the pronunciation. Thank you. So I've seen um, you tweet about him. I've seen you retweet. Yeah. Where are uh, you? No, well, I, I, number one, I support Jay Inslee um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, number one, because uh, I've seen him do uh, a phenomenal job. And you look at the economy of the state, uh, you look at our ability to get through some real big challenges. Number two, um, I think that you know it's a crowded race, and it's always uphill if you're coming from um, a state you know that's that's out here that's not as well known in, in certain ways, unfortunately. Uh, but I think that for him to both uh, shine a light on climate change in the unique way that only really only he can and then also to tell our story um, I think is is really wonderful for us um, and then a distant but important third is that he appointed my mom to the King County Superior Court and so like <laughs> what kind of a son would I be if I didn't 
Uh, Especially so after all, all that free, free legal help. Yeah, all the legal, yeah, you heard about my mom. You all love my mom. So how could you not love the governor who appointed her to the bench, right? So, so like, I, you know, so look, I, I love Jay. I, I love Governor Inslee and, and Trudy, um, and they're wonderful. Um, I've known Pete Buttigieg for many years. We were Rhodes Scholars together at Oxford. Um, and I just have a ton of respect for him. And you see the way that he's running this campaign. There are others as well, right? Um, and, and I know some others. I've met others. I don't know others as well as I know him. Um, but he knows very well that uh, my loyalty is to Governor Inslee. And, um, you know, there's, there's no shortage. This is an embarrassment of riches this year. The key is going to be to my fellow Democrats Let's not eat our own. Let's not destroy one another. You know, let's, oh, let's not, you know, what I hate to see is when somebody has a good media week, like you're seeing this with Pete already, like he has a good media week already. People are saying, why is everyone being so nice to Pete? Why are they being nice? Because he's, you know, he's a great mayor who's got great ideas and so are the other candidates. They've also got great ideas. We don't, it doesn't need to be zero sum. And so we shouldn't feel threatened when other people are talked about in the media in a positive way. This is part of a year and a half long selection process. There's plenty of time to recognize everyone's greatness. Well, speaking of zero sum, uh, at the top of your Twitter account, you, you have a tweet that's pinned. It says, zero sum politics cannot drive out zero sum politics. Only politics rooted in abundance and generosity can do that. Tell us about that. Uh, well, it's a. It's, it's uh, as, as you all know, paraphrasing or a, 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 um, a, a use of a, a twist on Dr. King's uh, words. It is, uh, the idea is that, look, we know that President Trump and Steve Bannon and others who inform him ideologically want to make our politics about, look, if Blind Iranian Americans are doing well. That means that, you know, you in Michigan or Aberdeen are not doing well, right? That's the story they want to tell. They want to make it zero sum um, and make people feel threatened by equality. Um, and sometimes there are people on my side of the aisle who are really happy to pick that gauntlet up and to have fight a fight on those terms um, and to say, you know what? This is about uh, taking power away from other people. This is about saying to you, you know what, you're privileged, you're powerful. Well, you know what, a lot of people out there, go back to the thing I was saying earlier about you could be blind and around the American, but also from Bellevue. Um, similarly, you know, you can be a straight white male and also be suffering from mental illness or also, you know, also um, have, ha have lost um, your parents or your uh, loved one um, in war or have uh, opiate addiction in your family or have been dis dislocated economically uh, by trade and automation. And so it doesn't, that's what I mean by abundance and generosity. When we talk about those issues, if I, we talk about what's going on in Aberdeen, that doesn't mean that we're not talking about Rainier Beach as well. It doesn't mean we don't care about that. It's only those who would try to pit one against the other who win when we buy into that rhetoric. And so that's, to me, you know, the, there's something really important about being uh, uh, conscious of uh, structures of inequality. But I think it's important to be woke with grace. And, and that's what that quote is all about. Yeah. Enrique. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, um, I'm wondering what you think of the calls from folks on the other side of the aisle as the governor runs for uh, president, uh, calling for him to uh, reimburse the state for his uh, campaign costs, spe specifically for the costs of, you know, uh, his safety and the state patrol. And, and I think, that. you know, I, I think it's, um, do you all think that in a, $52 billion biennial budget, which is just the operating, but then there's a transportation and capital budget. Uh, do we really think that um, those, uh, those, those cries, those calls are coming from them looking at the budget and saying, you know where the most important place to save some money is? <laughs> it's right here. Look, it's a political thing. Now, on the merits of it, so number one, I think let's just recognize that it's political. 
Um, they think that that's a way to embarrass the governor. I think we ought to be proud that a Washington state governor is running for president, right? I mean, you've got states out there like New Jersey and Minnesota and, um, and Texas that have had presidential candidates in pretty much every cycle, right? And Massachusetts. Um, and so we've gotten to know those places. Um, you know, I mean, even Arkansas has had but, the Clintons and Mike Huckabee. But right? is it fair? But, we, but, but, my, but, but here we are, we got a president, we got a governor who's out there telling the Washington State story. I think that's great. Now, in terms of the merits of it, here's the thing the, the policy is the same for him as if you were running for re election, which is that when someone runs for governor, they get executive protection. And by the way, that goes for people who are not the current governor. Right? So when you're, if you're the challenger. And so the, the, the point there is if you want to have safety, you got you to extend it to the campaign as well. And a campaign that can't afford security is going to mean that that candidate's going to go out there and be at risk. And so that's the policy that we have right now. And um, it's, it's not uh, the kind of money that is uh, at issue in our budget. It's a political cheap shot that they want to take in him. And, uh, you know, I think he's, he's made a decision, and I'm sure as the campaign goes forward, we'll continue to reassess that issue. So um, there's an international relations component to your job yeah, that there's... you chose, trade, some tourism. Uh, what's your elevator pitch about, about Washington State when you're doing that, <coughs> taking trade missions? So the first thing, so it, it, it depends on um, what sectors we're promoting. Um, so, you know, the, what, I, what I tell people about Washington State is that um, when you look at our country and, and you know, the kind of um, absurd, um, I don't know, semi-farcical experience of the HQ2 search kind of showed us this, is that when you look at economic development in this country, the places that have the, uh, the leg up are the ones that have invested in human capital and infrastructural capital. We know that if the folks on the other side of the aisle were right about economic development, that you know states like Mississippi and Alabama would be running circles around us. Because if all it took was just deregulate and cut taxes, um, then you know we we would not have California, Washington State, New York, Massachusetts uh, dominating uh, job growth. And so we know we have to make those investments. So when I go around the world, what I tell them about is, look, this is a place that's got the cheapest, cleanest power. So if you have an energy intensive uh, industry, then you ought to know it's the cheapest and it's the cleanest in the country. Um, we've got the two most valuable and successful largest companies in the world. And I hope somebody in California is watching this live stream right now so they know <laughs> that those are not Silicon Valley companies. So I say, look, if you want talent, we've got talent that the two biggest companies uh, have hired and, and, and all the offshoots from those. And then we've got institutions like UW, uh, the Port of Seattle and our other ports, the Gates Foundation and so many others. This is the place to be. And when it comes to tech, by the way, I tell them, look, if you think that what's cutting edge in high tech and information technology is social media and silicon based devices then you're living in like 20 or 30 years ago if you think the future of tech is cloud computing big data ai and machine learning then let me tell you about azure let me tell you about alexa let me tell you about aws let me tell you about cortana those are the platforms that every sector from industrial development to uh, customer service, all of them are going to be built on. And so companies should come and be a part of that. Well, that was a long elevator ride. Um, <laughs> but When I'm pitching but I'm in China and Dubai, they have <laughs> tall buildings, Joni, so I get a lot of that in. But, um, but I'm out of time here, and I, so much fun to speak with you. I, I have to wrap it up here. We have been Thank chatting so with Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib. We're coming back shortly to talk to the region's top two law enforcement officers. Thank Thanks you. a ton. Thank you so much. We are back now, eager to catch up with two key police leaders, Seattle Police Chief Carmen Best 
and King County Sheriff Mitzi Jo Hanknick. So, so nice to see you both again. Yeah. Good, to see you. Um, Good to see you. Glad you're here. Chief Best, that was quite the non-Seattle moment last week. A carjacking, random shooting, two innocent people killed, a bus kind of trying to get to safety. What is going on in once quaint Seattle? <laughs> Wow, Joni, right out the gate, huh? Yeah, right out the gate. <laughs> that's what, yeah, that's well, what we yeah, said. Yeah, I know. Same yeah. thing. Well, you know, honestly, um, for that whole incident, I could not have been more proud of the response of the Seattle Police Department. You know, these things are unpredictable when they happen, and they happen all over the country at different times in different ways. But we had a really coordinated response. Uh, my entire command staff showed up. They took command of the scene. They worked with the fire department. They um, used their tactics. You know, if this had been, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we might not have seen the same tactics that we saw out there with the officers joining up and King County officers joining them, uh, being tactically sound and making sure they took um, the suspect in custody um, in the most efficient way possible. So, you know, while it's a tragedy on a lot of fronts, um, I think the officers uh, and the firefighters and all the first responders did a really good job responding. Well, in the same incident, as you mentioned, there was this bus driver. Yeah, uh, heroic. Yes. King County is responsible for bus safety. Uh, I wonder, you know, this bus driver had to back his bus around and get onto a, a side street to protect uh, the riders, the 12 riders that were on there. Uh, do we underestimate sometimes uh, all the bus drivers are asked to do out on the streets? I think there's a lot of people we underestimate, Joni. Uh, um, when it comes to that moment, you find out whether um, you're in it for the fight or the flight piece. And in this case, um, the clarity of thought of mind and to take the actions that the bus driver took, pretty amazing. And then to back that rig around uh, a corner and get, get everybody on board to safety, it's, uh, it's impressive. Yeah, I would say, and I went to the hospital, and I talked, his name is Eric Stark. I talked to him, and I talked to the school teacher, um, Debbie Judd, and boy, they are, the media stories just, just do not do them justice of, of seeing them in person and looking in their eyes and talking to them and having them relive their experience and how they thought through it. I, I was so impressed, sincerely impressed. Quite, a, quite an event there. Yep. Uh, Chief Best Seattle is nearing the end of its uh, lengthy court-ordered reforms. But the city has been a, a little bit of a tussle with the judge over a discipline matter and the police union contract. After all these years of hard work, um, is Seattle really at risk? Are we really in trouble? Or are we really at risk of not meeting these uh, federal requirements? I learned a long time ago never to uh, Never to outguess the judge. <laughs> we had a judge in our audience. <laughs> we'll be careful about it. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think that you know, I, I think that um, you know, all this is going to be before Judge Robart, and he is you know as solid as any um, federal court judge that there is there could be, and um, you know I think he's going to rule in a way that's going to make the mess, most sense for our organization. I absolutely believe that 100 percent. And you know, with the discipline matter, you know, I, I believe that we went as we did as much as we could do, and what we believed. And this is a, about um, an excessive force issue. You know, we believe excessive force was used. We believe it violated policy. The arbitrator agreed, but didn't agree with the outcome. And sometimes that happens. But, but you're we, not even for the reinstatement, are you? You personally? No. I mean, the, the organization, the city, has already uh, appealed. But you know, we also have to have respect for due process. You know, employees have due process, and regardless of the outcome, whether I agree with it or not, um, I still am in favor of due process and making sure that we do things with a level of, um, you know, of um, rules about how things work. Uh, Sheriff Joe Hecknick, homeless numbers uh, are up again in our community. Uh, a lot of money is being spent, has been spent. Uh, Seattle is dying. This documentary is the absolute talk of the town right now. Uh, and the documentary seems to have struck a chord. What truths, if any, did you see in this? And I'm assuming that you saw the documentary. Well, I always like to refer City of Seattle issues to Chief Best. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nicely done. <laughs> nicely done. However, um, however, <laughs> however, um, 
So, you know, this is, people know, this is King County in Seattle. It's where I live. I li currently live in the city, and it's my home. And, um, you know, we have homelessness issues elsewhere in the jurisdictions that the sheriff's office covers. Um, we work with the city of Seattle with our transit agencies. And so um, there's one thing I really know. There are a lot of folks and organizations and nonprofits and government that are doing a lot of tremendous work to help solve this problem. And it's, it's those folks that deserve a lot of credit. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and the other side of it is we can't police our way out of this. We are a cooperative partner in how we go about uh, bringing an end to homelessness. Chief Best, it turns out that the perception of these increased crime is quite different from the actual crime rate. This was a story that we all read today. Uh, so it's actually much lower, property crime and violent crime, uh, than it was, say, 20 or 30 years ago, although that's true nationally as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is, what is going on? This, this documentary really made people stand up and say, what is happening to our city? So your there's question a, is? The sense, well, there's a sense that crime is more prevalent than, than the numbers seem to show. Well, I think people are just concerned because the landscape, you know, admittedly has changed, you know, and it's much more um, prevalent and visible in the city than I think it was a few years ago. And so people are very Do concerned. Do you think about that's it. because, you know, you know, so much is developed, there's not that many sort of out of the way spaces? I read that some. Yeah, I can't really answer that. I mean, there, there'll be lots of researchers and thoughts about how, you know, what, why. Um, but I think that there's some truth to the fact that it's more visible, and I don't think anybody would argue that. Um, and I would go back to what Mitzi said, or Sheriff Johanko said, <laughs> about um, you know, making, that we all have a role to play, and, a, and, um, and it's going to take all of us coming together in very specific, multidisciplinary approaches. We are not going to arrest our way out of homelessness. We don't want to conflate the issue of crime and homelessness. They're not the same thing. And so that is where I want to keep that conversation. You know, there's this, if I had to draw a diagram, there's this circle of, you know, homelessness. There's this circle of, you know, criminals and criminal activity. And there is some over, you know, some, you know, where no, they over, over right, you know, over. And, and that whole thing belongs to us. But there's a whole other section that, that contributes to those issues that have nothing to do with crime. And so we just want to make sure we're not throwing it all in there together and making it one, you know, one big issue. Yeah, and we're all just, you know, have, uh, are so close within our own families, within our own groups of friends that have behavioral health issues and, or may even be homeless within our families. So it touches home um, for a lot of folks. And um, I think that's why um, we look at it holistically as how we go about this together. Sure. Well, Sheriff Joe Hanknick, you're not a fan of safe injection sites. Uh, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, but there's some leniency that some people view um, that's part of safe injection sites. Is that, you know, one of the reasons that you're not for them? The idea that it sort of projects this sense that, you know, we'll, we'll be lenient with you no, no matter what you do. Well, I don't know if it's about lenience. I think um, we all have our different opinions uh, about um, injection sites and whether they'll work or not. I think for me, that's just a, a part of a very broad issue, Joni, that, that is really, really complex. And so, um, you know, there's uh, the, the crime. I think that there's one thing that I believe that crime is being underreported in the area. And so that, that doesn't significantly help us in, in doing our job to try to solve crimes or to help. Uh, folks that need need help. Amy Radel, join us. Yeah, I have a question for Chief Best. Uh, we have a new requirement in Washington of independent investigations when someone dies in a police encounter. And I know you asked the Washington State Patrol to investigate the death of Yosia Falatogo. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask you, what's the status of that investigation? And then broadly, what are your kind of hopes or concerns around these new independent investigations? 
Yeah, well, I, the State Patrol still has it and is still looking at I mean, all of the you know, various um, complexities around you know, an officer-involved shooting. So we'll look forward to hearing what, you know, what they come back with. But you know, the, the people have spoken, right? This is what people want. And there's lots of places in the country where um, there is independent investigation. So right now, the, um, the requirement is through the Washington State Criminal Justice um, Training Commission, their committee, to come up with the rules around how we do that. And um, there's a carve out for the Seattle Police Department because we're under a federal consent decree. But even with that, um, we know that, 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 that we're going to have to have independent investigation. We're looking forward to hearing what rules and what stipulations are required. But in the meantime, we are turning our investigations over. We have a reciprocal. Um, agreement with King County and with Bellevue that um, we'll have outside people, uh, outside um, agencies looking at our investigations and if they have the same thing, we'll look at theirs. Because we really want to make sure that we're in the spirit of what people want until we have more firm roles. So that's where I am on it. I have a question for uh, both of you actually. Um, what is it that you want the public to understand that you think they, they don't understand about the challenges uh, your department, your officers face? in dealing with the whole issue of homelessness, which I think you've pointed out. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, I think there's an economic component here. I think there's also the homeless component, a drug issue, but Jeez, how much well time as, do we have yeah. here, Tony? <laughs> Endless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the tape, yeah, the yeah. tape never runs out. Uh, no, but I, was, I think there's an expectation yeah. from law enforcement right. that maybe frustrates people. So I'm giving you an opportunity to say. Sure, to talk about that. Yeah. Well, look, I think about this stuff all of the time, right? How are we going to provide the service that we need to and be a part of the solution um, for these really complex issues. And they're multifaceted, uh, they're very complex, but when people say that, you know, the officers, you know, they need to arrest everybody. Well, you know, we're not gonna arrest people because they're homeless. We, we will arrest people for criminal activity. And, I, and, and by the way, I would say last year, I think we made it around um, just under 11,000 arrests. You know, so uh, that's a lot of arrests, more than they did in 2017 and much more than they did in 2016. And oh, by the way, we also made, you know, thousands of referrals for, um, you know, for people to get into services. So the officers are working hard, and I feel really strongly about getting that message out there. They're working day in and day out. Their productivity is up 38%. You know, our numbers are increasing as fast as the city is growing. You know, look on every single corner, and there is pretty much a, you know, a, a new building being built um, everywhere you look. So I think that the job is really hard, you know, especially I could talk about the Seattle Police Department specifically. We, the officers wear body-worn camera. The officers have a camera in the front seat of the car. The officers have a camera in the back seat of the car. The office ha we have an uh, Office of Inspector General, 15 people fully staffed that look at our policies, our procedures, our training, our audits, everything. We also have a 21-person uh, community police commission looking at our policies, our procedures, our training, everything. We also have an Office of uh, Professional Accountability looking at every single complaint that comes through and investigating everything. And then we're beholden to the federal monitor and the federal court and the Department of Justice. There is not an organization, a police agency in this country that has more oversight than the Seattle Police Department, and they're still doing the work, and they're doing a really good job. Crime is a, rel it's a really relatively safe city. Um, as the article showed today, when I was a PIO, I remember reporting 80, 79, 78, year after year homicides. And while we had a slight uptick, it is less than half of that now. And so I think that you know, we need to keep things in perspective. I know I'm going on, but I really feel strongly that you know, the officers are doing the work um, and the city, while we have our challenges of a growing city, it is still a really good city to be in. And we're all working together to, to meet these challenges that we have. Yeah, Sheriff, you yeah. want to add to that? Yeah. And I, I think it's fair to say that, that, uh, that officers and deputies and detectives and sergeants and captains and all those folks doing the work, um, they sometimes get discouraged. They too want to be able to provide the best possible service they can to the communities that they serve. We, we um, you know, for example, in the sheriff's office, we have only 733 commissioned police officers, um, deputies, um, and so that serves all of King County, and um, and so. Uh, they work hard every day, as Chief Best has said. It's um, sometimes, uh, most times, we're dealing with folks who are in crisis. Mm -hmm. And so 
Um, you, have to, you have to have a heart of service to do this, and you have to be able to let stuff roll off your back. And it's the very few times when we don't, when we get complaints for people. It's a great question, but I think our cops do a great job in this county. Right. Last year, we, we responded to 15,995 crisis calls. That's just crisis calls. It's up 26% across the city. You know, I'm looking at these numbers all the time. That is a lot of people who need services and who need assistance. And so I would say that you know, there's, there's a lot of work that has to be done. It shouldn't all fall at the, at the feet of the, of the, of the cops. Um, I'd like to ask both of you, but I'll start with Sheriff Jahanknik about the new inquest process that um, we're going to see unveiled in King County this spring. I think we're going to uh, jurors are going to look at whether officers followed training and policy. Is my understanding? Um, what's kind of your you know perspective, or what do you think the impact of this new process is going to be? Um, I've talked publicly about this before. I think it's going to make things very very complicated. You have Initiative 940 and the aftermath of that with the amendment of the, of the Senate bill or the, what was done this legislative session, um, which is talking to us about um, you know, changing the law for use of deadly force in the state and, and how it gets investigated independently. And I thank Chief Best and the, and the Seattle Police Department for doing our uh, deadly force investigations. Um, they have a lot to do, so I appreciate that. I think the, the inquest process, being one, the only county in the state of Washington and one of three counties nationally that still has inquest processes, um, and th with the rule change, we're all going to have to see where it, where it rides out. But I think it's going to uh, complicate the way the system is set up. Sheriff Joe Hagnick, uh, the Sheriff's Office in Seattle, they're, they're both involved in this, in a new interjurisdictional effort to enforce court orders uh, that prohibit people at risk of harming themselves or others from access to guns. This group, as I understand it, has been up and running about a year. Is it working? Yeah, it's yes. working great. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, look, the audience can answer for yeah. us. <laughs> yes, it is working. Um, extreme yeah. risk protection orders. Um, yeah, the voters you it's know, a, supported that. It's getting to be a national. It was talked about in the uh, Senate um, back in Washington, D.C., yes. I think. Renee Hopkins and others were there um, speaking about it. So, so how uh, do you know it's working? Uh, by the number of guns that we've taken in and, and taken away from folks under these orders that um, were at risk to hurting themselves or others. Right. Um, chief Best, the last time you were on this show, you were interim chief. And then came that moment, I believe it was last summer, where you weren't going to be the chief, yes. but then half the city complained because they wanted you to be this, <laughs> uh, to have this job. So I know you're not going to say anything too exciting about the mayor, but um, what did you learn uh, from that moment in your career? Because you were kind of quiet. You, were, you know, you know I, people have asked about that, but I, you know, I just love the organization in the city so much. I really do, and so. Um, whatever, wherever the chips fall, they fall where they may. But you know, my only goal was to make sure that whatever transition, that the, that it was smooth, because I've been you know in this organization at that time for 26 years, you know, which was you know half of my life working with the men and women in in the department, and I just wanted things to work well. It's a hard job, and in, and having, um, you know. Uh, Discontent or uh, you know problems at the top of the organization would only make things worse, and we wanted to, I wanted to keep it smooth. So you know you know it worked out for me in the end. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah, that was really my focus was making sure that things were smooth for for the organization. Audience, hi. Hi. A uh, question for both Chief Best and Sheriff Joe Hankton. Uh, there is a lot of concern here in the city of Seattle about. Um, uh, the fact that you're understaffed and there's some picking and choosing about which laws to enforce. Uh, you just talked about ERPOs, uh, the new, a new rule on top of all the rules and laws that we have to follow, and um, people overstaying visas and road rage incidences with sheriff's deputies, and then upstanding citizens who contribute to the communities and just happen to own several bump stocks. And the question is, what can you do to assure us that you will apply the laws um, uh, fairly and equally, especially when it comes to heroin possession? 
So if, if your question is, I think I kind of alluded to this earlier, you know, are the cops doing their job and are they making arrests and are they you know, working in the field? And my answer to that is they absolutely are. And the idea that, you know, one of the things that I talk about when I talk to, you know, either the rookie officer up to all the veterans is that, you know, we as law enforcement have an opportunity being the most public facing um, arm of government to really help um, be the great equalizer. And the way we do that is by providing constitutional policing in every instance. It doesn't mean that you as a white male or someone as a homeless person or me as a black female get any different treatment. We have to have human, um, we have to uh, regard human rights, civil rights, and constitutional policing and, and, and enforce the law equally. And that is really the mantra that I move forward with every single day. And if somebody doesn't do that, then they're going to be held accountable. Yeah, same answer. Um, it's not my job to interpret the law. It's my job to enforce the law and ask, and everybody in the sheriff's office does that work. And then it goes from there to, to determine whether or not the prosecutor prosecutes and, and then how it's adjudicated. So that's what we do. So one good way to build um, trust in the community is to hire really good police officers. But uh, recruiting right now is difficult for many of the departments. Yeah. Uh, you're giving bonuses, I think, big bonuses. So how hard is it right now? Uh, we'll start with you, Sheriff Joe Hank, to, um, to hire officers for unincorporated King County or some of the, some of the suburban uh, departments that you work with. Yeah, so um, we're, we're having uh, a lot of qualified people applying to be cops now. And so um, our hiring process is going really well. The thing that uh, burdens both of us is the small number of academy classes there are for the state every year and the number of people that we get to slot into those to to get through the training academy uh, and so I'm waiting to see what the budget ends up being for that um, uh, at the state level but um, I think there's there's folks that want to do this work there um, what are the bonuses that are that I'm are being sorry? offered Aren't, isn't it hard to also to get enough people as well? Um, Are you competing with some other departments? It's challenging, and I think we've both had people um, leave our organization to go to other ones, but you know the grass isn't always greener on the other side of the fence. It's I just, tell them that every time they say they're going to go to the county, I'm like, the grass is not always greener over there. <laughs> <laughs> we got green uniforms, though. Um, what, so, kind, what kind of bonuses for the Chief Bass? Uh, how hard well, is you know, we're offering a, a $15,000 a bonus for lateral hires from or, other organizations. Is that similar to what you do? Uh, we're not op we're not offering bonuses at this yeah. point. Yeah, and we did that mostly to keep up. You know, so we, that's great. But you know, Bellevue's offering sixteen thousand. Everett's offering fifteen thousand. Port of Seattle's offering fifteen thousand. It's a really competitive area for us to try to get people to come in. We're also doing seven thousand five hundred dollar um, bonuses for um, new hires. You know that they get after they complete the academy. Uh, you know, one of the things that I always say, you don't want to complain about the fact that we have a good economy. You know, there's under 4% unemployment, and we're competing with Amazon and Microsoft and Expedia and Zillow and Costco and all these other places that are hiring people right now. Um, and so we really have to appeal to folks um, who want to be a part of something, I say, that's bigger than themselves, who want to really give back. You know, we always appeal to those people who want to, you know, fly helicopters or banging doors or that kind of thing. But, you know, really this job is... Is that how you advertise? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Come here. Uh, we, there is, I mean, that's what people think about, you know. But honestly, this job is so much more about service. It really is about um, seeing people in really vulnerable situations, suspects, witnesses, and victims, and, and making that outreach to them every single day. And the cops do it all of the time, every day. Those yeah. stories don't get the headlines, but I guarantee you there, there's so many officers who reach in their own pocket on a daily basis and help people and do really um, you know, heroic things that aren't necessarily advertised or going to make the headlines. Um, so I would say that we really want to appeal to that person who wants to give back, because it's, it's competitive. Yeah. And it's not just Seattle, but it's, you know, it's several agencies across the country. Yeah, and I like to remind people, the best opportunity you have to, to letting you, your law enforcement agency know what your expectations are to join the agency 
We can affect the best change by having people with ideas about change and, so, and, and from the community come and be a part of us and help us uh, make those changes as well. Sure. Enrique? I'm just curious, um, how often do the two of you communicate, collaborate, commiserate <laughs> about your jobs? I mean, really, do you, uh, you know, the, you're both in the same vicinity or right. area and all of this. I Are you in it touch out, with but them? We definitely talk on a, on a routine basis. You know, and one of the things is, you know, sort of maybe it's a stereotype about, you know, women not getting along or whatever it is. <laughs> I feel completely supported by Mitzi Jo Hagnick. You know, we, we don't want to agree on every single issue, but I think that um, her commitment to um, the safety of the county and of the men and women who work for her is, you know, the highest ever. And, um, you know, I feel like we can, you know, communicate and talk on some of these very complex issues mm -hmm. about how we're moving forward. And I feel and, very And supportive. aren't you forced to work together now on homelessness anyway because of the... Yeah. Well, yeah, we, I see it as we get to do it, right? We, yeah. get, to, we get to have successes and, and sometimes we have failures that we learn from, but um, this is, I'm, I'm so glad that, that Carmen's the full-time chief for Seattle for, because she's my police chief too, I tell yeah. people, yeah. and I couldn't be prouder to have her as a friend. Yeah. Audience question, hi there. Hi. Uh, just a question for both of you. You've talked a little bit about uh, perception, right, in terms of people thinking there's maybe more crime than there is. Mm -hmm. I think for a lot of people of a younger generation, interactions with police are typically if you've either had a bicycle stolen or your car prowled, and sometimes it's not really a best experience interacting with police, or you hear about deadly uh, force being used, and it's sometimes filtered through social media, or like, you know, there's other parts of it. Um, but typically, policing used to be part of community policing, right? Mm -hmm. You used to know your local sure. cop on the beat. You used to trust them because you knew them. Do you think there is a gap between, you know, the police force and the community that they serve? And if there is a gap, how do you think you can bridge that divide? Well, you know, clearly we need to engage in community policing. We need to have as many officers out. Um, we have a collaborative policing bureau, and the reason we did that um, was because I wanted to make sure we had a deliberate and intentional focus on making sure we're building relationships um, at all, you know, in all areas that we can. Because the cops who are answering 911 calls, they're busy. 800,000 calls came into our 911 center last year, and 400,000 different responses. So that's a lot of work. You know, and as you, as I said earlier, 16,000, 15,995 crisis calls alone. So I'm not asking the, the, the beat officer to, I want them to be respectful and every um, engagement is an opportunity, but we also want to have a really a coordinated, focused approach where we're really um, giving uh, officers and community members an opportunity to engage with one another that's not necessarily related to an enforcement situation. So we do mentoring. We, um, we hire young people to work in the summer. We have a whole host of advisory councils, East African, African American, Latino, LGBTQ, Southeast Asian, Korean, um, Native American advisory councils that meet and talk and bring up issues um, where we can just have the chance to just talk it through um, in, the, in the organization. So I think you know it's really important that we have those opportunities and we make those connections uh, and we're working really hard to do it all the time. 10 seconds. For your answer. Ten, ten seconds? <laughs> yeah. Holy cow. Um, so it is quality of life issues that affect most people, the bike theft, the car prowl, those things. Um, when you patrol unincorporated King County, it's very rural, and so um, community policing takes on a whole new spin. But it's uh, doable, and um, Chief Best answered really well, so. <laughs> <laughs> that was really nice, thank you. We are wrapping up a great conversation with King County Sheriff Mitzi Jo Hanknick and Seattle Police Chief Carmen Best. We'll return in May. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you.